supplementary statement of case for leave to add an additional ground of review and for leave to file further submissions in respect of our application for review. Now, that application was refused by the court. You heard the superior arguments of our counsel on the matter. Our counsel presented authorities, several of them, in which the court in the past has actually granted leave to applicants before the court to file supplementary statements of case. Our application was refused. Now, it's unfortunate that these rulings that are coming out of the court are so short. In the past, especially in 2013, we had detailed reasoned rulings on why applications were either granted or refused. That has not happened this time. Now, when you examine or when you listen to the ruling of the court, the only reason they give is that the rules do not allow for it. So if the rules do not allow for it, why has it been permitted in the past? And so we think that the petitioner is not being treated fairly in these circumstances. And um, it's unfortunate, but we have to say it as it is. The petitioner is not being treated fairly. Now, counsel for the petitioner made reference to a specific case, Elistamaklu, in which that related to an application for leave to file um, supplementary. Now, that particular case, they were allowed to file a supplementary statement of case. The Supreme Court claims that is distinguishable from this one. We disagree because we believe that the intent of filing these supplements is to aid the administration of justice. But it was refused. Now, a second application, which was actually the application for review, which we filed in respect of the ruling of 19th January, that refused our application for leave to serve interrogatories on the first respondent's chair, that is, Jean Mensah. That application was also reviewed. You all heard the very superior arguments of our counsel. He said there were fundamental errors with the decision. The fundamental errors he listed were one. The Supreme Court said the interrogatories were not relevant. How can the Supreme Court say that in the light of the questions that we had posed in the interrogatories? For example, issues of transparency. When did Jean Mensah, for example, discover that she had made errors? When did she discover that she had made errors? What was the process by which she corrected those errors? Who did she consult? in correcting those errors? Did she consult the agents of the candidates? And you will see, if you've seen our witness statement, the kind of activities that took place that day, where they sent the agents of the, of the petitioner to go and consult with the petitioner on an issue, only to turn around and declare the results. This is what a chairperson who's supposed to be impartial, not be actuated by bias. This is how she behaved that day. And it's in our witness statement. How can anyone say that those questions are not relevant? Secondly, there was also a fundamental error in relation to the refusal to apply order 22 of CI 47. Now, you are all aware that order by now, that order 22 of CI 47 relates to interrogatories. In 2013, there were no rules on interrogatories in CI 16. And yet, the then petitioner, Nane Kufuado, was allowed 
to serve interrogatories on the respondents. Nothing has changed except the package of CI 99. Again, there's nothing in CI 99 that says that a petitioner cannot serve interrogatories. And so we disagreed with the court and thought that the petitioner has been denied a right to a fair hearing. And we referred to cases which said that if a petitioner on grounds of expedition is denied a right to serve interrogatories, that is a denial of a right to a fair, a fair hearing. And so we are saying that the refusal of our applications are not fair to the petitioner in the light of the past and in the light of what is happening now. So we disagree with the rulings of the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, that's their decision. There's not much we can do. We'll be in court tomorrow.